Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Thursday, September 9th edition of the Norton Select Board meeting. We appreciate the patience of, of those in the Zoom lobby. We quite literally ran into every technical challenge one could imagine to, to get the meeting online. Uh, thanks to Shane for uh, coming in and getting us squared away. So do appreciate the patience. Uh, let the record show that all five members are present. We have four members physically here at the library, myself, uh, Michael, Christine, and Meg, and on Zoom is Renee. Um, I'd like to start by doing the Pledge of Allegiance. Join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Um, do we have anyone on the Zoom or in the room here today uh, for the public comment period. If you do, please just raise your hand and uh, I can acknowledge you. Do not see anyone in the room nor on the Zoom. So we will go to appointments, resignations, and retirements. Uh, Christine, do you have those pulled up? I got what I really needed, yes. Okay, so first up, we're going to so I think we have uh, the appointment of Seth T. Stewart as a full-time civil service police officer to Newark Police Department. I believe I saw Chief Clark on. Chief, if you'd like to say a few words. Uh, good evening. So this is the point we'll be back from uh, the position that's uh, vacant. Um, Seth is actually on uh, I guess that uh, he appointed effective November 1st, 2021 to attend the Randolph Police Academy. He's been a special police officer for us for uh, basically since 2017. Uh, he went through the Reserve Intermittent Academy. He's uh, been working his gifts in detail. He's also graduated from UMass Law with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. And he's also a, uh, a EMT. Uh, he uh, has completed all the prerequisite of background checks, physical, medical, and psychological. And I did attack his resume early on. That's great. Any questions for Chief Clark? All right. Uh, Christine, if you'd like to read the letter. Yep. Um, so this is dated August 26, 2021. This letter is to recommend that you appoint the following town resident as a full-time civil service police officer, effective November 1st, 2021, to attend the Randolph Police Academy. Seth T. Stewart. Show me your address of it. Um, I think we may be on the wrong one. I think we need this one. Oh, that boy? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I hereby notify the select board that in accordance with the provisions of Article 4, Section 2B of the Norton Charter, acting in my capacity as appointing authority, I have appointed the following individual as a full-time civil service police officer, Seth T. Stewart. Said appointment was made on August 26, 2021, in accordance with the provisions of the Norton Charter, and will be effective September 10, 2021, unless the select board votes to accept or reject the appointment prior to that date. However, I specifically request the board's acceptance of this appointment with an effective date of November 1st, 2021. All right. Uh, seeing as there were no further questions, Chair would obtain a motion to uh, accept the appointment of Seth T. Stewart. So moved. Second. All right. Motion and a second. We'll go to the roll. Renee? Yes. Yeah. Meg? Yes. Christine? Yes. Michael? Aye. I too and a yes. Uh, congratulations, uh, Seth, and congratulations, Chief Clark. Thank you. Ms. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, sir. Chief Clark, can I just ask one question? Is this, I, do you have a full roster at this point? Well, we have, uh, we have these two people going to the academy. About a month ago, you appointed another individual who's going to the academy September 20th. The academy is roughly 24 weeks long, uh, so you know, they, they won't be, they really won't be available to work until um, probably April or May full time of next year. So we won't see them on the street, if you will, until that time. 
Now, I will say, since you asked, I will say that I do think we should hire two additional people. The civil service exam, the list just came out uh, September 1st. There may be, uh, you know, the plan for the future, I think it would be beneficial to hire one person and then, uh, you know, there's always that overtime issue that comes up that people uh, talk about, and I think that hiring another person would uh, do a good job of control of Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, may I do a follow-up? Absolutely. Mike, have you, um, is, will, will we probably be seeing that in the budget for next year, or is that something that, is this something that you and the Chief are discussing, or? Yeah, something the Chief and I will discuss and see what we can do in the budget for okay. next year. Okay, all right. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, next up, we have two for uh, Norton Fire. Um, I see Chief Simmons is on. Good evening, Chief. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we're very happy to be requesting these two appointments. Um, both these individuals are already trained, certified firefighter and paramedics with the state of Massachusetts and have several years of experience. They're actually both transferring to us uh, from Attleboro, and uh, both of them are, are very highly regarded um, in the area and the field, so we're excited to have them. That's excellent news. Any uh, questions for Chief Simmons? All right. Take us away, Christine. Can I have a point of clarification? Absolutely. If they have different effective dates, should I read them separately or can I read? Yes. Can I read them separately? Okay, yep. thank you. All right. So, note, notice of appointment of permanent full time firefighter paramedic. I hereby notify the select board that, in accordance with the provisions of Article 4, Section 2B, of the Norton Charter acting in my, in my capacity as the appointing authority, I have appointed the following individual as the permanent full-time firefighter slash paramedic in the Norton Fire Department, Michael Canada. The appointment was made on September 1st, 2021 and will be effective September 16th, 2021, unless the select board votes to accept or reject the appointment prior to said date. However, I specifically re ooh, request that the board's acceptance of this appointment be effective September 11th, 2021. Uh, Chair would entertain a motion to accept the appointment of Michael Canada. So moved. Second. All right, motion and a second. Renee? Yes. Yeah. Meg? Yes. Christine? Yes. Michael? Aye. Aye to am yes. Congratulations, Michael. All right, and notice of appointment of full time, permanent full time firefighter paramedic. I hereby notify the select board that in accordance with the provisions of Article 4, Section 2B of the Norton Charter, acting in my capacity as the appointing authority, I have appointed the following individual as a permanent full-time firefighter paramedic in the Norton Fire Department, Richard Whitney. The appointment was made on September 1st, 2021 and will be effective September 16th, 2021, unless the select board votes to accept or reject the appointment prior to said date. However, I specifically request that the board's acceptance of this appointment be effective October 1st, 2021. All right. Uh, Chair, would entertain a motion to accept the appointment of Richard Whitney. So moved. Second. All right. Renee? Yes. Meg? Yes. Christine? Yes. Michael? Aye. Aye, too. And yes. Congratulations, sir. Uh, quick question, Chief Simmons. Uh, are, uh, do you need to send a rather large fruit basket to your counterpart in Attleboro for taking two of his, uh, his staff? <laughs> <laughs> We already had that discussion. We're, we're good. <laughs> uh, Excellent. Well, I'm very glad. Yeah, <laughs> we worked it out. <laughs> Wonderful. And how does that set you for staffing? Uh, that would have brought us up to uh, to full staffing. Uh, you know, we still don't have the people from the academy yet, but uh, just recently we have had two more, two people transferring to other apartments closer to where they grew up and uh, where they have more family. So we're going to actually be too short um, as of as of this week. Um, call for a civil service list on Thursday. Deadline for uh, individuals to sign up for that is tomorrow, and so far we have zero signatures. So, um, we're actually trying to find other people through uh, creative ways. All right. All right. Well, best of luck. Thank you. All righty. Uh, Thank you. All. Thanks, sir. Uh, next up, we have the appointment of Rachel. How do you say her last name? Midas. Midas as recording secretary. All right. Notice of appointment of recording secretary. I hereby notify the select board that in accordance with the provisions of Article 4, Section 2B of the Norton Charter, acting in my capacity as appointing authority, I have appointed the following individual as recording secretary, Rachel Midas. 
Said appointment was made on September 2nd, 2021 in accordance with the provisions of the Norton Charter and will be effective September 17th, 2021, unless the select board votes to accept or reject the appointment prior to that date. I specifically request the board's acceptance of this appointment with the effective date of September 13th, 2021. All right, uh, any questions on this one? Um, I just could, um, I wanna thank Rachel. Uh, Rachel will be like the swim person for uh, uh, minutes when uh, we need someone available for me uh, any meeting finance committee planning board water sewer um, Rachel is uh, currently a student at Bridgewater State. She's a uh, Norton resident and uh, Will be a great help in filling in Excellent yes, and, and my, Where is the um, where is she positioned within the organization? Um, Rachel will be a uh, part-time recording secretary. So is that is that under you or under Michelle? That would be under me. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, uh, Chair, I need to motion to accept the appointment of Rachel Midas as recording secretary. So moved. Second. Uh, Renee? Yes. Meg? Yes. Christine? Yes. Michael? Aye. Aye, two am yes. Congratulations, Rachel. Thank you for joining. Uh, two more. Appointment of Brian Carmichael. All right, notice of appointment, full-time group B planning zone administrative secretary. Yep. Good. Okay. I hereby notify the select board that in accordance with the provisions of Article 4, Section 2B of the Norton Charter, acting in my capacity as appointing authority, I have appointed the following individual as full-time Group B Administrative Secretary to the Planning and Economic Development Department in the Zoning Board of Appeals, Brian Carmichael. Said appointment was made on September 7, 2021 in accordance with the provisions of the Norton Charter and will be effective September 22, 2021, unless the select board votes to accept or reject the appointment prior to that date. I specifically request that the board's acceptance of this appointment with an effective date of September 20th, 2021. All right. Any questions on this? Yeah. Like, can you give us a little color on this position or? Yeah, is this is uh, the staff position that's been vacant in the uh, planning department. So um, Brian will be working with Paul D. Giuseppe in the planning department. Okay. Great. All right. Anything else? I know I don't know if Brian's on yet. Uh, I do not see okay. Brian. I haven't seen him either. I look for Paul C. He must still be in the other meeting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Excellent. Uh, well, Chair, I stand a motion to accept the appointment of Brian Carmichael. So moved. Second. All right. Uh, Renee. Yes. Meg. Yes. Christine. Yes. Michael. Aye. Aye. Two. M. E. S. You know, Renee, if we were all in the same room, we could just do a voice vote. We could. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Uh, next up is the appointment of a select board representative to the Capital Improvements Committee. I uh, believe, Christine, this is something you have been doing. Um, do you have an interest in continuing on? Sure. <laughs> One meeting didn't didn't uh, didn't didn't scare didn't, didn't, didn't away. Didn't no, away huh? Good. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to make a motion um, to approve Christine Devoe as the select board representative to the Capital Improvements Committee. So moved. We have a second. Motion. Second. Is yeah, second. Yeah, motion. Motion. second. Yeah, I know. Oh, I second. Yeah. <laughs> uh, excellent. Uh, Renee. Second. Yeah. Meg. Yes. Christine? Yes. Michael? Aye. Me too. Congratulations, Christine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other appointments? All right. That brings us to licenses and permits. The application of Bristol Beverages, Inc., DBA, Barrisville Station, 194 South Bristol Street for a change of manager from Krinal Patel to Vishal Patel. Do you have anyone to speak to that? This is just a... There's to be on. Uh, if anyone online is here to speak about that, just uh, feel free to unmute yourself. 
don't see anybody, so perhaps we put this off to the side and come back to it. Yeah. Okay. Is this a hearing mic, or is this is this just on the agenda? It, was this a set hearing? Or it doesn't need hearing. It's it just a change of manager. Okay. So someone remind me that that remains open. Okay. Yeah. Okay. General. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Uh, all right, moving on, uh, we have a one-day beer and wine liquor license to Elias Da Silva, New England Rodeo for a private event, 185 North Washington Street, from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Sunday, September 19th. I uh, believe we have all the paperwork. Everything seems to be signed off. Uh, any questions on this or any comments? Um, is there someone there? Let's see. You're going to be on. Uh, Hi, I'm on from New England Rodeo. Hi, Kelly. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, another event at New England Rodeo? Yes. Yeah, we're, we're looking at having a memorial for um, one of our toddlers that passed away in previous years. Um, so, we're, we're looking to have the beer. The wine license. Um, I think we were talking about hiring two police details um, to make sure that during the uh, during the duration and afterwards um, that we have people who use the available to, to make sure everybody enters and enters the All right. Excellent. Uh, I believe this is your second one this season. Any? Um, how did your How did your first one go? Um, really good. Very really successful. No issues. Excellent. I'm sure it was a long time coming for you guys uh, with the pandemic and everything, so glad to have you back in action. Absolutely. We're on the All right. Uh, any further questions? Mr. Chairman. Yep. So, um, Kelly, this is on a Sunday evening, is that correct? Uh, Sunday, two to, 2 to 8. The 400 people, yes. you see that as a hard number? You don't see it going over 400? Oh, exactly, yeah. No, no problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, we, you, we sell tickets in advance, so we can't go over that number. Okay. And you see 8 o'clock. What's the ramp down? Obviously, the liquor license till 8 o'clock. What do you see the ramp down of the crowd at that point? We're, we're hoping everybody out by 9. Um, okay. You know, we all have to go to work the next day. That's our, <laughs> our kind of our feelings and our mottos. So. Yeah, we know. I get it. I get it. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Any other questions for... All right, uh, Chairman, entertain a motion to approve the one-day uh, beer and liquor license application for Elias De Silva, 185 North Washington Street, um, New England Rodeo for September 19th from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. So moved. Second. Right. Renee? Yes. Yeah. Meg? Yes. Yeah. Christine? Yes. Yeah. Michael? Aye. Aye, too. Amy, yes. Have a, a great event. and. Um, yeah, great cause. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, all right. Next up, uh, I'm just checking if we have. Wait for name. Don't see him. Uh, vote to approve a special events application for Norton Parks and Rec for the 28th annual Charlie Halloween Parade, to be held Sunday, October 31st, 2021, from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. It's back. It is. Yes. Excellent. Looking forward to it and going to be in the float as the honorary mayor of Naughton. Fantastic. Ah. Um, Chief Fire. Yep. And this will run from the town line in Attleboro along 123 to St. Mary's Church at Olympia Street. Yes. Mr. Chairman, Mayor. Absolutely. Uh, Mike, I didn't see, um, did I miss it? I didn't see a uh, sign off from Keith Silver's crew or Keith, from Keith on this. Is there, is that a requirement or is that a? No. No, okay, but he's aware of, of it and the cleanup necessary with it and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything looks great. It's good to have it back. Uh, any questions on this one? Uh, Jack, I just have one question. Uh, what are we dressing up as? Yeah. Uh, Jack, do you notice that she always doesn't really matter if it's Halloween? She's always asking us to dress up. Hey, uh, <laughs> Renee and I were the only two to dress up last year, so uh, 
I'm down for it. Right. What do you want we, to do? We have five. We got to figure out a good. You could do uh, the Scooby Doo crew. Yes. Uh -huh. Do Richard of Oz. You have some ideas uh, flowing. Yeah. Uh, if we discuss Halloween costumes outside of a meeting, is that going to be a uh, no, no, I think violation? that's allowed. On All right. That. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. I'm, I'm on board, Renee. Let's, let's have some fun. Excellent. Let's do it. I have a good play. I'd like to make a motion to approve the special events application for um, the 28th annual Charlie Halloween Parade. Uh, on October 31st, 2021, to go from the town line of Atterboro along Route 123, ending at St. Mary's. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Three. From noon to 2 p.m., sorry. Uh, Renee? Yes. Meg? Yes. Christine? Yes. Michael? Aye. Two am yes. Welcome back, Halloween. We've missed you. Uh, seeing no other announcements and our prior guests don't appear to be on yet, we will move on to announcements. Uh, Christine? Okay, so the first one is the Norton Public li Library Flea Market and Book Sale. So the Friends of the Library are having a flea market and book pop-up book sale on the library <laughs> lawn, Saturday, September 18th, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, the rain date is September 25th, but we're hoping it doesn't rain. And then we have the Friends of the Norton Senior Center. There's a Senior Center Barbecue at the VFW. Friday, September 10th, so tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Um, they'll have a barbecue and music outdoors under the pavilion. Uh, the cost is free, but you must sign up at the Senior Center. It was yesterday, so if you're a member of the Senior Center or have signed up before, um, you're able to go. And that's again at 38 Summer Street in Norin, the VFW post 8049. Um, don't get mad, I have three other announcements. No, go for it. Okay. Um, so then the Norin Historical Society on Saturday, September 11th is having a fall flea market, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. This is located at the Norton Historical Society at 18 West Main Street in Norton, Massachusetts. Um, and also on the 11th, it's a busy weekend this week, um, there's a Norton Reservoir Cleanup Day, Saturday the 11th, 9 a.m. to noon. Um, if you go over to the Norton Kayak Company, they'll give you a trash bag, and if you have a kayak or a canoe, um, you can go along the reservoir and clean, help clean up what our beautiful land is. Um, you, can either, you can reach Norton Kayak at 508-740-7728 or email info at nortonkayak.com. And then we have a community outreach that I just want to read about. Um, the public notice that was sent out for the Lucky Green Ladies LLC. So this notice is hereby given that Lucky Green Ladies LLC will hold a virtual community outreach meeting for a proposed adult use marijuana home delivery operator establishment on Monday, October 4th, 2021 at 6 p.m. Participants may choose to attend the meeting either online or by telephone. The purpose of this public meeting is to provide inter interested parties with an opportunity to ask questions and receive answers from company represent representatives about the proposed facility and operations. The proposed sitting is 394 Old Colony Road, Unit B, Rear, Norton. That's all I got. All right, excellent. Jack, is it appropriate to tell everyone that tomorrow night is the first Friday night football game for Northern High School? I it's believe it is. 7 o'clock? <laughs> I'll be there. Go right. Everyone be there. Excellent. Where they're purple. Who are they playing? Sharon. Sharon, excellent. Yeah, it'll be a big game. The concession stand will be open, big fundraising going on, so show up with lots of cash. <laughs> All right, excellent. I'll have to ask for an allowance from my wife yes. for that one. All right, excellent. Good treats. Uh, wonderful. Any other announcements to share? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Christina Mike. Uh, that brings us on to new business. Uh, our friend uh, Mr. Zahner is on the line. Uh, welcome, Chris. How's everybody doing today? Doing good, Chris. Yeah. Chris, We're doing good. Not worried about COVID at all. Because I'm fully vaccinated and I'm losing my mind. Right? To the normal. Okay. Couldn't have said it any better myself. <laughs> how, how are you? How are things in the field? 
Good. Um, I, as usual, I brought a PowerPoint to get myself through this because I'm always nervous to be on here. <laughs> um, you don't need to be nervous with us, Chris. Say, you're, you're amongst friends here, Chris. Yeah. I get stage fright. <laughs> <laughs> can you see my screen okay? We yeah. can. Yep. Okay, good. Okay. All right, so, yeah. Um, thanks for having me tonight. I'll give you a quick update on where we're at with uh, COVID. Um, as everybody knows, we've had, you know, a... Uh, slight increase in cases in the past few weeks. Let me get my thing to change pages here. Hold on one second. Okay. Um, so we've had the slight increase in cases in the last few weeks. Uh, that appears to be coming back down for us, which is um, currently, uh, as of uh, today, uh, since March 2020, we have had 1,814 total cases. Um, currently today we have 19 total in isolation um, active cases going right now. Um, the one thing I didn't put on here, which I'll just kind of say, uh, is I did get an email. Somebody asked me about you know how many of those 19 were vaccinated, um, and I believe that number off the top of my head is approximately 14, um, which in a way is is really good because it shows we have. A lot of the vaccinated people in town, but the, you know, and I'll move on to the next. I'll, I'll go on to the uh, vaccination part later, but and talk about the breakthrough part of uh, vaccinating you know, the COVID cases. Um, so at any rate, uh, we're still at 11 deaths, which is you know not always. It's not great to talk about because you know we didn't want to lose anybody, but I'm glad we haven't had any additional deaths in quite some time. Uh, currently in Norton, we've got 50, 57% of all residents are fully vaccinated, which is not too bad. Uh, it'd be nice to get that up closer to the 70, and we're working on it because we're at 63% that's had at least one uh, dose of the vaccine. So we're working on getting that up. Um, those are great numbers right there. Uh, and our positivity rate is down to 1.44, also a great number. Um, Chris, does that take into account that the 12 and or 11 and under can't get vaccinated? That how many are actually currently vaccinated? Uh, I think that's why there's a 70 percent number because I think that the uh, the 30 percent includes you know is more the kids that or people that aren't eligible. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Next. Uh, this chart here just shows how things have gone since the start of the pandemic um, as far as cases in Norton. Um, yes, we had a, a, a spike there in, in August up to 100. Um, and in September, we are already up to 29, which is a lot as of the night. Um, so we are still in a, in a small spike here. Um, when I say the cases are coming down, I'm just seeing the activity for us. Uh, in Norton is starting to slow down a little bit. I'm hoping that uh, that continues. Uh, but we'll, we'll see that we got to give it a week or so to see if we get any backlash from the uh, Labor Day weekend um, and, and go from there. Um, hey, Chris, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, of the 19 of the 19 cases in isolation, how many of those are clustered? Is that meaning there's two clusters, three clusters, meaning is it families or is it just really 19 separate cases? Um, the family spread has still been an issue. Uh, we do have uh, one household um, currently in that 19 that is uh, four cases. Okay. Um, and then there was a couple of twos. Um, so that does happen still. Um, but quite honestly, it's, it's been less than it was before. It used to be more common. Now it seems like we're getting uh, individuals, single cases. Okay, thank you. I think that partly because of the, you know, the vaccine, partly because people are become more aware of, um, you know, watching out for symptoms and isolating fast and, and getting, you know, letting everybody know to quarantine that needs to quarantine and everybody's become more educated with it. So it's, I think it's, uh, I think that's all part of the reasons. 
why we're seeing those little spread down. Uh, ages, same thing that it's always been. The younger crowd seems to be uh, the largest case count. Um, and that's a great thing uh, on the older crowd that has not come up very much at all. Uh, it's great to have that because those are the people that are more... Um, I'm on a meeting. If you don't mind, if you could come back in like 20 minutes. Sorry, I'm live on a meeting right now. If you could just... <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, the cleaning people just committed the office. Um, oh, anyway, yeah, the, the cases for the for the elderly have, have stayed down, which is great because they were the most vulnerable. Uh, the Delta variant is starting to get the younger crowd. We have had uh, quite a few zero to eighteen uh, category since the Delta variant has come out. Uh, no serious serious Ill, uh, illness. Um, a lot of them are uh, like a head cold or uh, a day or so of a flu-like symptom, but that's about it. Um, let me move on here. So for uh, breakdowns by age, Chris, uh, I think there's probably going to be uh, a lot of interest to see how the return to school impacts our numbers. Is it possible uh, to uh, do a subset of the data as of the return to school, so September 7th? with an age breakdown? What I can, what I have been doing is this case, this chart here I've been doing for the schools. Uh, on a weekly basis, I put together our cases as we get them in. So I wouldn't necessarily look at this as saying this is a spike because this is how the tests come in. It's not necessarily how people are getting sick. So it's not really uh, one to look at as far as trending. Um, but. I do put this category at the end for school age kids, which is, I put it between the ages of 5 and 18. Okay. Uh, and that shows you that we, in last week, we, you know, last week we had two. Um, and that's been about the average two to three cases. Um, it's only been a couple weeks, so. Yep. Uh, but it's been very minimal. And again, um, the parents have been excellent. Once they know that that case is there, they, they've isolated their kids, they've notified the schools. Um, they've, the schools and, I, and, and our office are uh, always in communication, uh, working together with the contact trace. Excellent. And is that uh, information available on the, the Board of Health website? No, but I can make another category on the FR uh, ages 5 to 18 if we want to. Yeah, I just think that's going to be something that people are going to be but, interested but to active see. Active cases between those ages. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Wheaton College, uh, just to give you an idea of where they're at this year, um, since the start of the semester, they've had almost 5,000 uh, tests done. Uh, they've tested everybody that came into the school this year. Uh, out of that, out of those tests, they've had 10 positive results. So, so far this semester, their positivity rate was up, uh, was at about 0.2%. Um, in the last seven days, they've only had one. So I think it's the, in most of uh, the bulk of that uh, 10 was the initial, initial surge of students coming into town. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for, for Wheaton to uh, put forth the effort to get everybody tested and isolate as they're coming in, and it, it eliminates the spread. Um, so we've only got one active case right now with Wheaton in the last seven days which is fantastic, puts their positivity rate at about 0.09%. Excellent. So they're going well, which is good because I will show you this next, on our next one, my next uh, slide here, other news in the Norton Board of Health office. I'll skip down to the bottom one that shows that the Norton Board of Health is now also in charge of all contact tracing for Wheaton College, as the CTC does not have the capacity to handle higher education institutions like the Board of Health does, but huh. <laughs> um, so what happened here was the state back in uh, the end of June when they let all the um, employees for the CTC go because everything opened up and the restrictions were lifted and the cases were down, um, they made the decision to let their staff go and put the contact tracing on the local public health departments. Uh, because they figured it was going to be very minimal, you know. 
Then the Delta variant came along, and now they're scrambling to bring everybody back to the CTC, um, and we're scrambling to try to keep up with, with Wheaton. Uh, fortunately for us, it has not been crazy, but it's just been a lot to coordinate and communicate back and forth between us and the uh, college itself. Um, so, but, you know, just another thing added to the list of uh, things to do here. Um, on top of that, we have a new public health nurse, Jacqueline, which I know you've met uh, a couple weeks ago. And Jacqueline's doing very well, uh, but again, she was a, our, she was a nurse at uh, Rhode Island Hospital, um, did not have a ton of experience in public health office, so there's still training to be done there. There's still, uh, you know, getting her acclimated to the way things are done in the office and, and in public health, uh, local public health offices. And, and on top of that, we're trying to keep up with all this other stuff that's going on. So we've been very busy, uh, you know, getting things moving here now that we're on with a new nurse. But uh, slowly but surely, it's, it's, it's going in the right direction yet. Uh, and then currently, one of the things that is a positive uh, when it came to the, uh, the CTC was that we were able to get a grant working with Bansfield, Foxborough, Sharon, and Easton uh, that's going to uh, allow us to hire an epidemiologist as well as a couple of uh, some contact tracers to assist, assist the towns, those uh, five towns, um, once the CTC is no longer available. And as of right now, the CTC's last day of service is looking like it's going to end uh, the end of the calendar year. However, I did hear a rumor that that might change to the end of November because I heard that they may change what they consider it, um, necessary contact tracing. So, um, but that's to be updated later. It's, it's all stuff I just recently heard and I don't know how true it is. Um, so, things are crazy, things are crazy busy, but we do have help on the way. And finally, uh, to end my presentation, as I usually do, I'll always thank the residents of Norton who have been amazing and so supportive to us here at the Board of Health and through this pandemic, as well as you know the select board and school committee, everybody's been supportive and, and we can't thank you well enough. Um, and with that, I'll leave you with any questions. Thank you, Chris. Michael? Um, Chris, I have two questions. Is Wheaton testing like they did before or they, they what's their testing uh, frequency at this point? Um, I know last year they were testing, I believe once a week. Uh, I think that, that's, we, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, Wheaton College. Wheaton College, so they're testing, right now they they just got done with their initial surge testing, coming everybody coming in. Yeah. Uh, leave their testing as as the cases arise or as symptoms arise or, you know, I don't think they're on a weekly right now, um, but I, I could check on that. I'm not positive. Okay, do you, do you know if they're open to maybe assisting you with some of the contact tracing at all? And while and while we're trying to figure out the grant, no. Okay. No, they tell us we have no, they have no um, resources over there to help us with that, and that uh, it's on us. Okay. Um, and do you, besides obviously a person, and while we're trying to figure out the CTC grant, and uh, is there anything else that you need to make your job easier during this time? No, I think at this point we're, we're in control. We're not out of control. You've got, you know, like I said, minimal active cases. 19's not too tough to deal with. Um, fortunately, like I said earlier, you know, we've got a few of those that are household spread, which makes contact tracing much easier. Um, so, and we are still at this point able to utilize CTC with our local cases. So we're not overwhelmed with contact tracing. Um, just at right this point, this office is is mainly dealing with. Um, a few of the local cases, but mainly with the Wheaton cases, while the CTC is taking our locals. Okay. And my, mm -hmm. and my last question, um, in August, obviously with the surge and it made sense, um, you had a recommendation about wearing masks in municipal buildings. Are you, is that still your guidance at this point, or is it um, something that you're evaluating as we kind of move along here? You know, I think it's worked out well. I, you know. At least in common areas, everybody's been wearing a mask. Um, everybody's re been re very respectful of it. Uh, we've got masks at front and back door of the town hall, and, and multiple offices have them at their window. And I, you know, I just don't see why I take them off yet. Um, 
I think it's something we should maybe re we can reevaluate it in October or so. But um, I'd like to make sure that this this little surge we're having does continue to go down first. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your hard work. Thank you. Anybody else for Chris? Yeah. Um, for Jacqueline, I, is that how you pronounce her name? Okay. Jacqueline. For Jacqueline, um, does she have contact with other, you know, neighboring public health nurses? In you know, so she has somebody to reach out to. Uh, I know she said she, she took a couple classes in, in college and school, um, but you know, real real world isn't the same as college. So um, just want to make sure that she has you know a point of contact for, for somebody who's in the field so she can learn from them and communicate with them. Absolutely. So on that end of things, um, we work closely. Uh, we've always worked closely with the public health office in Attleboro, uh, as well as Plainville in North Attleboro, um, Mansfield and Foxboro. Um, and she has all, all of those offices that she could call. Um, but the one thing we've always had the greatest of is that we've always had contact with Donna Palmer, and Donna Palmer is still helping her. Um, and still, Donna was our previous nurse and was amazing, and um, and she still to this day loves to help Jacqueline's you know get things acclimated. She's for next week we're working on um, flu clinics, and and her and Donna are going to have a. Uh, a Zoom together to go over what Donna used to do for him. So it's it, we we have plenty of help. But thank you for asking. Perfect. So very good to hear. Thank you. Hey, uh, Jack. If I may, just a couple questions for Chris. Shoot. Sure. Um, so Chris, thank you for the presentation. I, I know I asked for the update, and uh, you went above and beyond. I, I was not looking for anything so detailed, but I do appreciate you taking the time because it actually has been a while since we've heard from you. So thank you so much for that. Um, I know you said Wheaton doesn't have uh, any resources to help, but have we thought about any opportunities to open up internships for any of the students where we may be able to provide them minimal training to, to help not necessarily do contact tracing, but maybe help with some of the other administrative duties in the office? Um, the tough part about it, and, and it's a great idea, um, the tough part about it is um, the administrative portion of it is on Maven, and there is a, it's a higher security website that only uh, authorized users can use. Um, the contact tracing, maybe we could put them through a contact tracing course and they could, and they could do that with a um, you know, confidentiality agreement. Um, but it's tough because it's, it's a HIPAA law. There's a lot of uh, privacy involved. Um, that being said, we have not, we have not uh, looked into that yet because I don't quite know that we're gonna need it, but it's, it's a good thought and I, I may very well do so. Yeah, and, and I would think, you know, if the, the logistical challenges are too much to have them involved in contact tracing, maybe there are other things in the office where they can do it in kind of free of your time or free of Jacqueline's time, right? Like something that they would learn, you know, about what the Board of Health does. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, sometimes it's filing, right? But it's, it's health. Um, and then the other thing, too, has, has Wheaton indicated or had any conversations on um, any sort of vaccine requirements that they may may institute for either their staff or students no they haven't but they but unbelievably they have a 90 plus percent vaccination rate over there that's, uh, that's so, staff and students yeah so great that's fantastic <laughs> that's fantastic the one thing i did want to talk about uh, i mentioned earlier um this the, when they i don't like the term breakthrough case the reason why I don't like that is that it, to me, a breakthrough case would be, that terminology should be used if the vaccine was told to all of us that are, 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 are promoted to us that if we could never get the virus if we got the vaccine. And then you got it. That's a breakthrough case in my eyes. Um, to me, what this is showing us is the vaccine's working. Um, we're, the, the cases that we do have that we call for breakthrough cases, the people are having minimal symptoms um, and it's fantastic to see although I hate to see them go through it at all um, it's not like it was before and so I hope that everybody out there can see that and I, I wish it was promoted more that way that you know yeah there might be cases out there the news media is putting it out there like you know the vaccine's not doing anything look at all these cases it's working and it's working well it's doing exactly what it was supposed to do so i hope more and more people continue to get vaccinated and, and we can hopefully keep this 
uh, virus in control and maybe gone someday, or if nothing else, you know, like the flu, and we can, you know, once a year get ourselves a booster. I agree with you, Chris. That's, that's, that's a great point. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other questions for Chris? Chris, um, President Biden just rolled out a vaccine mandate. It said all employees with foreign employees must require vaccines of weekly testing. All federal workers and contractors must be vaccinated, and all healthcare workers at medical and Medicaid participate in hospitals must be vaccinated. So I agree with Biden, and people need to stop putting laugh symbols and angry symbols when it comes to vaccines around because Biden is doing a good job. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Yep. Uh, and just to be clear, that is the federal government talking about vaccine mandates, not your local select board. <laughs> Lest there be any confusion. Or your local board of health. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Chris, I, I, I have, I think, hopefully one, one quick question. The Wheaton numbers, those are accounted for in our town totals, correct? So yes, so and actually, out of the there's so there was ten total, right? And out of the ten total, uh, probably I think it's four of them have left the town. So we've only really dealt with six in town. Okay. Uh, and they have their own buildings over there that they're able to isolate. Um, so it's it's going very well. Uh, but many of them were tested on their way in. They barely even got their stuff moved in, and they were told they're positive that they have to isolate. And they basically got in their car and went home. Right. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it's good on, on our end for that. I mean, I'm not sure if they're bringing it home and spreading it to everybody else, but, yep. you know, on our end, it's good that we don't have as many cases in town. All right. Excellent. Thank you for clarifying. Appreciate it. Yep. Uh, see no other questions. Uh, so, Chris, thank you so much. Hope you have a great night and best of luck out there. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right. Um, so I do see that um, we had somebody from um, Barrowsville Station join, so we can circle back to that one. Uh, we have the application of Bristol Beverages, DBA, Barrowsville Station, 194 South Worcester Street, uh, for a change of manager from Grinnell Patel to Vishal Patel. Uh, if a uh, person who's here to speak to that can unmute and say hello. Hi, uh, this is Vinas Patel from Bellsville Station. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Hey. Uh, hey. So this uh, application is just a change in uh, ownership or a change of manager from one person to another. Uh, nothing more than that, Mike? No. All right. Yes, in the man. All right. Uh, and this, does this get reviewed by the state? Yes. All right. Okay. And they've signed off on everything. And... Yeah. All right. If I can, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely, Mike. Um, Mr. Units, um, is there any um, outstanding complaints from um, the police department and or the ABCC regarding this license, or is there anything that is pending or that you are aware of? None that I know of. Okay. Thank you. If I, if I could just make a quick comment, too, I just want to say um, great job at what you're doing over there. It's been tremendous, and everyone on that side of town, I live on the other side of town, but on that side of town, tell me that, um, I'm not sure if it's you, but um, the, the management's always asking people what they can change and what they can improve upon, and so uh, from a resident standpoint, I just want to say thank you. That's, that's um, what we like to hear. So. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and okay. Mr. Patel, I have to stop by the store on a few occasions on my walks to the Barrowsville section. And you can, thanks, little quick country store. All right. Thank you, Peter. I'd like to make a motion to approve the management change at Barrowsville, um, also known as Bristol Beverages, Inc., uh, doing business as Barrowsville Station. We have a motion. We have a second. Second. Right. Uh, Renee? Yeah. Meg? Yes. Christine? Yes. Michael? Aye. I too am a yes. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate you joining, sir. And uh, have a great night.
You do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Good you luck to you, sir. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right. Uh, thank you for, for waiting. Uh, we now have item number two under new business. Review and vote the approval of municipal bonds. Um, and we have a special guest who dressed for the occasion on her, uh, her last night as a town employee. Uh, welcome. Thank you. So, yeah, I just missed two pages though, so I will pass those down that need signatures. Right, so I apologize for that. that. Yep. Could you just, uh, just for the record, could you just say your names and what you do? Sure, I'm Catherine Van Dyne. I'm your existing treasurer, soon to be your not treasurer anymore at 1231 tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> not 1232. Not 1232. Okay. And I am um, Lynn Foster Welch from Unibank Fiscal Advisory Services. I act as the financial advisor to the town of Norton. All right, excellent. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, why don't you tell us why you're here this evening? Okay, last week, um, the town sold uh, bonds in the market, which consisted of 4.8 million, uh, roughly representing the soft cost gearing up um, for the cash flow for the new town hall, senior community center. Um, and the other piece of the bond issue was the refunding of the 2008 uh, water bonds. They were $8 million issue. We refunded 2.8 million of the remaining balance of that. Uh, the town did very well in the market. Um, we got eight syndicates that bid on the deal. Uh, a firm by the name of Piper Sandler was the winning bid with a true interest cost of 1.47%. Um, these were 20-year bonds. And um, so what that represented on the 2.8 million that was refunded, it resulted for the water department in budgetary savings of $363,280. So basically what we'll do is swap out the old debt service for the new debt service in that case. Regarding the $4.8 million, um, there was a premium bid, um, which means it's a, it's a cash up front to the town in addition to the par amount of the bonds. Um, so we have approximately 397577 of premium that we will put to the project cost for the, for the large municipal uh, authorization that the town just voted. So that comes off of the authorized unissued, and so that basically to the town means that's money that's in your pocket that you will not have to bond going forward for that project. So what I have in front of you tonight was the vote. Um, I can either read it to you in summary and, and refer that the full, um, full vote will be incorporated into the minutes, or if you choose to, so if you'd like, you can read the whole vote that's um, in front of you tonight. And I also do want to just also um, tell you that Standard & Poor's did reconfirm the town's AA plus uh, credit rating. Um, and one notable um, within that is they have different criteria, obviously, that they, they weight their, their rating with. And one of the criteria is uh, financial management policies, which is kind of a nice segue into what you'll be doing and looking at next on the agenda. But I do want to give kudos to the town because they have improved the written policies and procedures put in place. So Standard & Poor has upgraded that criteria to strong um, from it was previously adequate. So within that, even though the rating itself didn't upgrade it, but one of those components did get um, improved from the last time that they looked at the town. So kudos to the folks here, uh, Mike, James, and Catherine, who have listened to the Standard & Poor's, re you know, uh, were on the call with them uh, quite frequently um, in listening to the feedback from standing, Standard & Poor's and trying to implement those policies that obviously help help the town in, in its bond rating. Um, so that is that is good news. Although you don't see an upgrade into AAA, you do see an improvement in that in that component. Um, so I'll defer to to the board tonight how, how you want to proceed. I can I can summarize the vote for you if in, if you'd like to reference the full minutes in the meeting, or it's obviously up to you how you want to 
Yeah, do the uh, I like option one, but is that going to be appropriate or acceptable for you guys? Jen, then, yeah? Okay. Um, so why don't we open up to questions first and then yeah, you can do the summary. Uh, any questions on this? Renee's got her reading eyes on. I do. <laughs> you see me in very, on a very large screen, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, I was just reading through the whole thing. Um, just a, a question I see that it says, uh, voted the each member of the select board and town clerk and town treasurer. Um, does that mean that the clerk has to be in attendance too? She does not have to be in attendance. Okay. I don't have any questions. I'm, I'm all for option one, too. I am very much in for option. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm just going to have you actually take two two votes. The first one that's, that's in front of you, the first vote, is basically the, um, the board approving the refunding of the bonds. So in summary, um, that in order to reduce interest costs, the treasurer is authorized to issue refunding bonds pursuant to chapter 44, section 21A, that's the refunding uh, laws of, of the state of Massachusetts. And then we're, we're refunding a portion of the town's $8 million general obligation water bonds dated August 1st, 2008, maturing on August 1st in the years of 2022 through 2028 inclusive. Pursuant to this vote shall be used to pay the principal redemption premium and interest on the refunded bonds and cost of issuance of the refunding bonds. All right. Uh, Chair, I didn't see that as a motion. Second. All right. Uh, Renee. Did you get it first? No. Oh, uh, I, yeah, motion. This is for the refunding. This the is the refunding. first for this is the refunding because yes. then we're going to have to reissue a new bond to cut the difference to pay the... Yep. Which we did, yeah. Which we did. You're basically voting to approve what we're voting. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we have that as a motion. Do we have a second? Seconded. Okay. Who, who made the motion? I think it was Meg. Okay. There is a typo in that first paragraph. I'm not sure if it matters or not. Michael. To refund a portion above. Yeah, under the first voted section, there is, is, is one that, on the right. Is that, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's a. Oh, there's two us, yeah. yeah. That's something minor that can be taken. It's minor. This is that's bond councils, yeah. the bond councils language. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, right. this is, yeah, that's fine. Right. Okay. Excellent. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, Renee? Yes. Meg? Yes. Christine? Yes. Michael? Aye. Aye, two, and yes. Thank you. Okay, so the next vote will be for the, the sale of 7,235,000 general obligation municipal purpose loan of 2021 bonds of the town dated September 15, 2021, so-called the bonds, to Piper Sandler and Company at a price of $8,091,208.34 in accrued interest, if any, is hereby approved and confirmed. The bonds will be payable on August 1st of the year and then the principal amounts that are shown in the full vote, which will be incorporated in the minutes. Right. Uh, Chair would entertain that as a motion. <coughs> so moved. Second. All right. I have a motion and a second. Renee? Yes. Meg? Yes. Christine? Yes. Michael? Aye. Aye, two, and yes. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And can I just, um, see my, just <laughs> my heartfelt thanks to Catherine. We've now worked together for a really long time. Well, and, um, yeah, we started as clients with each other, and now you end up sometimes best of friends. So uh, I'm going to miss you. I'm really going to miss you. Yep, the town hall is going to miss your present, Catherine. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Thank and you. Thank enjoy you. your retirement. Well, well deserved. I will. Thank you. Uh, feel free to come back and visit anytime. Okay. The PA is beautiful. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you moving to be closer to Donna? To, no, no, to close to the grandkids. Uh, probably better. All right. Excellent. Uh, next up, we have a discussion on the town financial policy manual. Uh, Obviously, you just received this. So um, we've been, as, uh, as was stated, we've been working on this for a while and uh, wanted to get this to you so you can take a look at it and um, 
if you could, if you have any questions at all, just uh, send us email with your questions and we can uh, look at any aspect. Um, but this is something that had come up previously on our standard and poor's call um, for the, our last borrowing. And uh, so we've worked to uh, put together a policy um, and uh, hope you can take a look at it and uh, give us some feedback on this. Um, Mr. Mike, I'm assuming I'm going to just take go on a lead limb here and correct if I'm wrong. I'm assuming this is James. This falls into James, or is this the treasurer, or is this um, a joint effort, or who's? Actually, it, actually, it's a joint effort of uh, James, the treasurer, the assessor, because there's different aspects okay. in here, and uh, you know everyone has been involved in working on it. And is there an adoption policy once we read it in thoroughly? Is this a select board adoption, a town adoption, or is this just in place? Um, I would like to get your uh, support, and uh, I'll also present it to the Finance Committee for the Finance Committee's input. Okay. And last but not least, is there a PowerPoint that goes along this for training of um, training of individuals in the town and so forth that can just review? kind of almost an overview of this besides just here read this sometimes it's easier to have a powerpoint as the training uh, there isn't with. right now no okay congratulations i know this, this is something you've been talking about for a while this is a lot of work yeah good job all right uh hey uh, i'm sorry jack before you launch mike is it possible can you send us through some words just so like i it's quite long, um, just so we can just put comments in for questions. Would that be okay? Yep, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, do you want to put this on the agenda, um, Mr. Chairman? Do you yeah. want to put this on a future meeting for an adoption from the select board? Is it? Do you uh, want to just kind of wait and yeah, paint I, back up? I think we meeting in two weeks. I would assume so. Yeah, we'll put it on there, and if we've had a chance to review it and provide comments, we can discuss it again. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Right. I think our next meeting is in a week, Jack. So can we do it in three weeks? Uh, no, sure. We're off cycle. Yeah. Yes. So, um, yeah, that, that that's fine. So three weeks. Okay. Mike, does that timeline work for you guys? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Uh, all right. Uh, we now have a presentation from Jim, Ho Jim Howland on the Greater Attleboro Town Home Consortium. AKA Gaff. Welcome, sir. Appreciate you uh, joining us this evening. Thank you. If you could just uh, introduce yourself as you get started, I appreciate that. Sure. Let me just get this, see how his is going to work. I was kind of ashamed of that. <laughs> you have to click the uh, enable editing first, and then you can do the share on the bottom right side. Jim Holland. Um, I work for the City of Taunton in the Office of Economic and Community Development. Um, our office is the lead agency for 14 communities that are known as the Greater Attleboro Taunton Home Consortium, and Norton is one of those 14 communities. Um, the consortium allows us to actually draw entitlement funds from HUD 
um, for use throughout the consortium region for a variety of housing-based issues. Um, the home program is specifically geared towards housing and housing units. We use them for three primary functions, three primary programs um, that I'd like to quickly hit on here today. And just to make sure your residents are aware of them, I know it's been a few years now, but I spoke with your council on aging, um, and I did the same presentation for them. I want to so actually now that COVID's been involved, it's probably been like four years since we've been over here. But so in front of you, you can see the actual member of towns. We cover everything from Plainville all the way out to Carver. Um, The three primary programs that we deal with, one is first time home buyers, home ownership. The second is the housing rehab program. And the third is housing development. The home ownership program allows us to provide um, down payment assistance for those that meet the guidelines for first time home buyers through HUD. There's all kinds of requirements as far as family dynamics, household income, and household income is all the income of all adult parties living in the house, not just those on the mortgage. Um, and there's eligible property restrictions as to what qualifies as a first time home buyer property. So there are things that we would need to get involved if, if you're interested in that. Um, we actually use another group um, we have a sub-recipient that deals with all our first-time home buyers program. So when you call us and ask about first-time home buyers, we're not being rude, but it's a very complicated program, and we're going to send you to another group. Um, and that other group is known as, as um, NeighborWorks. Your first-time home buyers are required to handle both, take both pre-purchase and post-purchase classes. Um, again, they have to meet the income guidelines. They have to buy a house that actually meets the purchase guidelines because there are limitations as to what they're allowed to buy as far as cost. Um, there's a lot involved with it. But that program is there. Should anybody need it, um, again, just reach out to us. So the very last slide of this presentation has the contact information directly for NeighborWorks if any of your residents want to reach out directly to them. Housing renovation. Um, again, there are income restrictions for the home, but it allows us to come in and perform general housing repairs for homeowners. That includes major code violations, major health and safety issues. Um, lead paint abatement has to be dealt with because it's a HUD program. So anybody that has a house prior, built prior to 1978, we are required to actually do a lead paint test on it. And as part of the program, we must abate it. Um, so we deal with it right up front. Um, our program, again, has all the same restrictions. We will also look at doing investor properties. The difference with investor properties and single family homes is single family homes are a 20 year forgiven loan. We actually will come in, we'll make all our repairs, we'll walk away and the idea is if you're there for 20 years, you've outlived basically the life cycle of the repairs we're gonna perform, so you shouldn't know us anything. So it does get forgiven over 20 years. As an investor property or straight rental property, it's an amortized 0% loan. Again, we look at it as you're providing the service by providing those affordable units. However, you're still making money off that rent and this allows us to recover some money to go back into the program. Any rental units involved in the programs always have affordable housing restrictions placed on them. So we actually cap what the allowable rents are based on the HUD guidelines and what HUD says your cap has to be. I'm ahead of myself. I hate when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> 
as I stated, all the housing renovation programs, there is an income eligibility requirement. Um, the income guidelines can be found at that website. When and if you contact us, when we send you out the application, that website is also on the application, so you can actually look up the income guidelines right by yourself. Um, as I stated, we've worked with your Council on Aging, we've spoken with your Vets Department, and just a few weeks ago we met with, I believe his name is Paul, gentleman Pete. from Community Development, Economic Development here, yep. um, and explained to him our programs so that if you have seniors or you, if you have families interested that are hesitant when they see the list of documents that we require, we can usually tell them, well, don't panic. You can go see the Council on Aging or go see the Veterans Agent. They'll explain to you why we need these items because it's basically going through a mortgage again. Um, and they can assist you in getting all the documents you need, scanning them if possible, and sending them to us that way if you don't want to send us the pack of paper. So that usually works out a little bit easier. Um, as the slide indicates, household income does include all sources of income from the persons living in the residence. That's all adults over 18. And that includes SSI, SSDI, all salaries, benefits, alimony, child support, pension, retirements, mainly the money you get back from your pension and retirements. And there are some but very few exceptions to that list. As I stated, the eligible homeowners are 0%, um, deferred payment forgivable, all our loans are forgivable after 20 years, rent restrictions apply to any rental properties, um, and the tenants of any rental properties must meet the income guidelines as well. Just keep that in mind. Typical repairs, again, we can deal with safety and code violations, we can deal with most structural and foundation issues, we can deal with mechanical problems, we must deal with lead paint when we come across it. Um, we commonly deal with electrical and wiring issues, plumbing issues, weatherization, general maintenance, and what the, the slide says handicapped accessibility, but ADA is actually a commercial standard, not a residential standard. Um, so I tend to refer to it as senior friendly corrections. Grandma can't snap to open the tub anymore. We'll take the tub out and make it a low rise shower for her with a shower seat and that type of thing. Um, so we will do that type of item as well. Uh, but those are kind of the, some of the standard repairs that we will typically get involved in. Um, the one thing that we should explain is when we come in, we have to fix everything that we find is deficient. The idea being I come in, I'm gonna do what we have to do, I'm gonna walk away and we're done for the 20 years, I don't come back. So the last thing I wanna do is walk in, fix the roof, replace the windows and get a call six months later that says, yeah, but the furnace doesn't work. So if we go in and we see that that furnace is 15, 20 years old, we're going to replace it right then and there. Um, as opposed to you know, get that call that says, yeah, you helped me, but you didn't help me enough. Mm. And this is just kind of typically what we started with. Um, this is actually a Norton house um, that we started with, and this is what was left behind when we left it, which is kind of typical of the exterior work that we did. Um, the stairs were all rotted and broken. The lady that owned this house actually had to go through the backyard to get into her house. She was unable to actually use her front steps. So we fixed that, new handrails, energy efficient doors, windows, new roof, new gutters, chimney cap to stop the squirrels from being in there. We fixed a couple of foundation leaks for her in this case. Um, did some lead paint abatement and actually renovated the bathroom because her bathroom was not serviceable for her anymore at the time. And that, oh yeah, I have to explain this one. I always have to put in here what's not eligible. We don't do additions. I can't add on to the house so that mom can come live with you. 
Um, we only deal with garages and outbuildings with the extent of lead-based paint. We're not allowed to renovate them or fix them otherwise. We don't touch driveways and sidewalks. That's considered part of the landscaping in HUD's world. We don't do landscaping and fencing. And no, I do not install jacuzzis, hot tubs, spas, or the step-in showers. Okay. Everyone has standards. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be amazing how many people want a you know, nice 10-person jacuzzi yeah. tub and you go, yeah. what? Um, and, and again, we can't take care of, we can't reimburse you for any repairs that you did prior to calling us or, or getting us involved. Okay. And then the last of the third programs is housing development. Um, and, and these are usually larger scale developers that have come in, usually the nonprofits that are coming in to do 40, 50, 60, 90 units of um, affordable housing. Um, we've dealt with a few of them over the years, none here in Norton as of yet. Um, but that is funding that is set aside through the HUD program as a requirement for us to put towards housing development. Um, in the past, we've worked in Easton before they left the consortium. Um, we've done one in Middleborough. We've dealt with one in Taunton where hopefully, actually we've already finished one in Attleboro. We're looking to do another one in Attleboro. Um, so they're out there if you're dealing with any of the large end developers. Um, and they want to reach out to us, we're more than happy to assist and explain to them the process. But getting the CHODO status, the, the Citizen Housing Development Organization status, is quite complicated. So this is a multi-year project. So if someone comes in and is looking to do this, they would need to reach out to us now to really look at a project in three to five years. Just, okay. It takes that long to get everything set up and organized. And usually these type of projects involve other things, low-income tax credits, historic tax credits, and all that type of stuff. And this is us. Um, anybody interested in the first-time home buyers program should reach out to NeighborWorks. They now have an office at 12 Taunton Green, which is the old Santander building downtown um, in Taunton. Um, Elvira is the lady that handles all of our cases for us. Or if you're looking for the housing rehab program, we are now in the renovated city hall in Taunton and not over in the old Board of Health building. Um, so you can reach us at 15 Summer Street on the third floor or you can just email me and I'm happy to answer any questions then um, when you go to email me. And that is my entire presentation five minutes or less. Unless you guys have questions. What do you get? Uh, great program. Michael? Jim, is this, um, I'm assuming this is a state and federally funded program because you got HUD in here, you've got... Is no, it? it is strictly HUD. Strictly it's HUD. Federal funds, correct. Okay, the, the current administration is talking about, do you, do you see this being beefed up a little bit more because the current administration, they, they're pounding this drum pretty loud. Um, um, the state actually has their own funding, okay. and the state runs similar programs. Um, in this case, because Taunton is considered an entitlement community, we don't have to go through the state. We get our funding directly from HUD right. um, to provide for the 14 towns through this program. Um, typically, the smaller towns, if they were not part of the program, Rehoboth, Easton now, Swansea, um, Raynham's with us, the Bridgewaters, they actually have to go back to the state and do all their applications for specific programs through the state. Um, and DHCD has funding for those programs through them. But everything we deal with is strictly HUD funding, comes directly from the feds to the city, and then the city goes out to the towns, to the clients. Mike, this is obviously a complex program, and I know that uh, our, our, our staff, uh, Veterans Agent and uh, Beth and over there in Council of Aging, I mean, do, do, they have the, do we have the resources to refer people to get them into this, to really, is this? Yeah, I mean, it's, as, as Jim said, it's, uh, the referral's an easy process if they contact uh, Beth or um, Estelle, 
and okay. they just have email or call right away and um, they're assisted by the program. Because I'm assuming by the Jim, I'm, I'm assuming by the time they reach out to you, people are almost at with they're almost at the end here where they yeah, they need they're almost crying at this point. They need help. We have gotten that, yeah. Um, and one of the bigger things we see is, especially with the seniors, is they're hesitant to want to see another mortgage filed on their property, um, which is one of the reasons that we changed the program um, a year or so ago to actually make it a forgivable loan so that they understood because one of the common complaints or common concerns we had was, you know, it took me 40 years to pay off the house. I don't want to leave it to my kids. I don't want any burden. I don't want, we get that. It's forgivable after 20. If you sell the property or it transfers hands in the first five years, you owe me the full amount. After that, it's all prorated. So if you're there for 10, then you only owe me 50% of what I had to put into it. And the whole idea being, A, to get more of the seniors willing to allow us to come in and make their homes livable. Um, the bigger problem we run into is almost the point of not them reaching out looking for help, but refusing to get the help they're offered. Um, one of the bigger problems I run into is that by the time they get to me, it's because the local health agent is knocking on their door saying you either call somebody to help you or I put a big red X on the house. And at that point, it becomes very difficult for me to go back in and fix the home, um, especially if it's a case where single family home, single bathroom, single kitchen, and I have to actually tear the bathroom apart or tear the kitchen apart. We now have to relocate that person find someone for them, some place for them to go why we tear apart their bathroom and kitchen because they have to have facilities within the house in order to stay there. Um, so that becomes kind of the challenge to this program is trying to work with those that have actually waited almost too long before they called me. So we actually try to get people involved early which is why we like to reach out to the Council on Aging first and the Veterans Agent first. When the Board of Health calls me, that A becomes an instant priority for us, no matter what town it's in. Um, but that's usually a desperate case where we're now looking at it going, okay, we're going to have to do other things here and possibly not only relocate them while we fix the home, but we have on occasion put into the agreements that they have to accept services to either Bristol County elders or whatever other agencies are in the neighborhood um, as a condition of the loan so that they can actually continue to maintain the property after we leave it. Right. Any other questions for Jim? Back, I, I just have one question. Um, Jim, you mentioned about the, the development projects and they're typically around 50 or 60 homes. Are there any opportunities to do smaller development projects, like two or three homes? Like if, if we had, um, say for example, some town-owned properties in residential areas, would, would this program be something that could be leveraged to put some affordable housing in there? There's so many what-ifs in that that I really can't answer. Um, we have looked at being able to assist groups like Habitat for Humanity um, and other groups like that. I mean, we've dealt with, you know, smaller nonprofits like the old Ware Corp in Taunton and Pro Home and um, a lot larger places like NeighborWorks and NOAA and some of the really large, um, big nonprofit affordable housing developers. But there's so many what ifs involved with that question that unless I had specific details on the land involved, who's actually developing it, and that type of thing, it's, I couldn't answer that for you right here. Yeah, no, I understand. And, and just to give you some background, as part of the Economic Development Commission, um, one of the members went through, um, actually, based on the treasurer's list, then. Um, some other information and went through to identify town-owned properties and, and several of those that like we were looking initially at where their properties potentially that we can have some additional economic development but we found some in residential areas 
So I don't know that there's any developer attached to them. I mean, we're not we're not that deep into the details. I'm just wondering if this would be an option if we identified um, a set of parcels where potentially two or three houses could go. Um, would this be something that a nonprofit or, or a developer could look at and leverage? It, it might be, and it really it, it depends on what nonprofit you get involved, or if you're dealing with a for-profit developer. My immediate thought would be to go almost from the other side of this, and we would then look at possibly setting aside first-time home buyers funding, and saying, okay, we may not be able to assist with the development cost, but we can assist with the first time home buyer side of it to give the affordable, to give the, the residents, to give the buyers that ability to actually get into the home and actually provide funding through the purchase end as opposed to the development end. Okay. So would, would you be in contact? Like once we had additional information, could we reach out to you? For absolutely. Some guidance? Absolutely. Okay. Mike's quite familiar with our office and you can reach out to either myself or our director very easily. Okay, thank you. Jim, thank you very much. It's a, a wonderful program. I uh, hope we get some more visibility to it and more people take advantage. It's here. Um, the brochures I handed you tonight, forgive me, we literally printed them out at like 4.30. <laughs> um, we've been trying to update our marketing materials. Um, so we're hoping to put out like 2,500 of those in the classy format like we used to have a few years back. Um, in the not too distant future, once we get them in, um, I'll be swinging by all 14 towns to drop some off. I do have another dozen or so that I will leave on the chair um, that you guys are feel free to leave wherever you think you should leave them, whether it be here in City Hall or hand them back to the Council on Aging or whoever. Right. Um, but yeah, we are here. You know, we're really easy to deal with. Um, just give us a call or an email and we can explain in detail to that client what's going to be necessary and how we can specifically help them because there, there are so many what ifs with these programs it's so hard to answer things in a generic state yeah. but we are around um, you know and I'm hoping that this is one of the first of a, a new program of outreach you know we, we did this like I said four or five years ago we wandered to each of the towns um, and then unfortunately we got so busy and sidetracked by other things we haven't been back out so hopefully we can correct that and get out to the rest of the towns and uh, kind of kick this program back into high gear over here I do want to throw out and I just noticed it's not on these slides I've got to fix it um, we do not do we can help you buy a condo but we do not repair condos or mobile homes. Um, if you're in a trailer or if you're on any type of shared property as far as a condominium complex, or we don't touch them because I can't mortgage that piece of land without mortgaging the entire parcel mm. and your neighbors really may not want the mortgage for me to fix your property. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's probably one of the few restrictions and calls that we get quite often is for, and I don't know what you guys what Norton has for mobile home parks, but um, we have a lot of manufactured housing in certain sections of Taunton and down through the Lakeville area, but we can't assist with those. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming Thank you, through. Jim. You're welcome. Appreciate that. Thank you, Jim. All right. Uh, thank you, sir. <clears throat> continuing in the presentation theme, uh, we have a presentation from the residents at Greatwoods. Hello. Good evening. Hi there. Welcome. Hi. I wish Hi. we were a little more formal. We don't have a PowerPoint presentation for the evening. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but myself, um, I'm Tiffany Michalski, and I'm the executive director. And Emily Shirelli is our director of resident um, sales and marketing that is joining us this evening. Um, we just wanted. We're really pleased to reintroduce um, to the Norton Select Board and the town of Norton. Um, the residence at Great Woods um, became owned and operated by LCD Senior Living back in February. 
Um, and we have some exciting news that we would like to share with the community. Um, back in the spring, we did have a ribbon cutting um, to kind of kick off uh, our construction for our memory care, which is going to be um, housed in the old um, skilled nursing home. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. And obviously, as things progress for the construction, we'll share more with the, with the town um, and hopefully get some photographs of what's coming um, towards it for everyone. Uh, we're really looking forward to the continued partnership with the community. I actually just celebrated 20 years at the campus in New Britain, so I've been there for a long time and um, seen lots of changes and really excited for the opportunities for our current seniors and seniors um, down the line and in the future. So um, I'll turn everything over to Emily and she can add, uh, talk about some of the new additions. Great. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, as Tiffany mentioned, we are um, kind of what about six months in from the ribbon cutting, so we thought it would be a good time to update everybody. We are getting a lot of um, activity and calls and people stopping in from the community. So we thought, him, hey, everybody must be a little bit interested as to what's going on. So let's uh, see if we can get on the agenda. Um, interestingly enough, we had a chef demo yesterday at the Council on Aging. And um, quite a few of the, the attendees were asking me, you know, what's going on? We see open, you know, tour, come on in, um, what's being built there? So I think it's really nice um, that the community is interested um, in, in us and, and what's going on. And um, when I started at the community, I just thought it was so amazing that the original um, you know, first purpose built nursing home in the state of Massachusetts is where we are. So I'm so excited that LCB was able to take that footprint and they're actually going to turn it into even a more expanded um, opportunity to service the, the community and the residents of Norton um, with our uh, memory care that will be opening next spring. So we're hoping we can get back on the docket with the PowerPoint <laughs> to actually talk about that. Um, but in the meantime, I wanted to extend an invitation to all of you. We would love to have you come in, um, see all of our apartments are in the process or have been remodeled. So um, we wanted to be able to bring that premium LCB standard, but make it affordable for seniors. So they shouldn't have wow. to compromise um, with dated apartments or dated amenities. So that's one of the um, really important missions for the company and for our community is to be able to offer that to Norton and the greater surrounding communities. Um, and we're your neighbors and the residents that live there are your neighbors. So we thought we'd love to be able to have you come visit them, um, taste our food, meet with them, talk to them, come, come through for a tour. We are um, having visitors. You just have to sign in and go through our screening and our kiosk at the front. Um, wear a mask, obviously, and we can take you through and, and um, you can observe some programs. Right now, um, we're doing mostly outdoors if, if there are visitors coming in. Um, families can visit and they can visit in the apartment with their loved ones. But, um, you know, this is a, a good segue after, um, you know, the Board of Health gave their update. Um, we still, we're very confident. We've had such a good... Um, handle on managing uh, the COVID that we want to keep it that way. <laughs> so we're being, being very protective of our residents, but still open to visitors at this time. Um, I wanted to also ask, I mean, do you have any particular questions? I know it's been a while since you probably thought about us or we had the ribbon cutting and I don't know if you, any of you have had the opportunity to stop in. You may have family or friends that are living there, but I'd love to be able to open and open it up to questions and answer anything for you. Um, Emily, I have a question, if I may. Um, I, I haven't been there for a couple of years, so certainly before you guys um, came in and, and you know, looking at changes, but um, it, I have two questions actually. So you mentioned the apartments that are there. Um, the services that you offer, is it assisted living, um, nursing home, and memory care, or? No, so right now we are um, assisted living. We do not have the memory care open. That will um, be opening by spring of 2022. Um, we should have 24 apartments, and there will be additional common spaces that are gonna be offered to our residents um, for the entire community. Um, you know, a wellness, uh, a new gym, 
um, a country store, a kitchen. So we really are improving what we have and adding and expanding to it. There is no nursing home component um, any longer. So that skilled nursing was actually closed. Um, so we are not a medical model, we're a social model, but we do offer the enhanced care levels um, so that a resident can age in place and, and continue to receive the care that they need. Okay, great. And, and can I just ask from a, a payment perspective, is this something, um, you know, that, that residents would live there for a certain amount of time or uh, and have Medicare support afterwards, or is it all yeah. private pay? Unfortunately, the state does not allow us to do that. Okay. So we are all private pay. Assisted, most of assisted living throughout the entire state is private pay. Um, we do not have any um, affordable um, apartments or uh, PACE or GAFC programs that some other um, communities throughout the state may have. So it is private pay, but we do offer um, affordable rent rates, and there is a level of care and med management that's included in that. I think our care levels on top of that are quite affordable for the market um, in New England and in the state. And we offer veterans assistance, um, long-term care insurance. So we try to work with any possible um, you know, financial uh, service organization or um, even any asset that the family may have. And you know, remarkably, this generation, they were planners. So they planned for their retirement and they planned they almost knew they were going to live to be into their 90s. <laughs> so amazingly enough, um, they saw that American dream. They were able to utilize their house and their pensions, and they worked for great companies, and they were able to you know, basically fund their way into having a comfortable retirement in a community setting. So they're not isolated anymore. And um, you know, I think that that is really the mission for LCB, to offer that comfort and that full wellness program. Um, but still be an affordable price point for folks. And, and do you, as part of like your, your community offerings, do you guys have any um, seminars or discussions on how people can plan for the next 10, 20 years? We do. We've been having to do mostly virtual, <laughs> as you know, with COVID. Um, we were hoping we were going to be able to host some things on site. Um, we're looking to partner more with the Council on Aging so that we can actually do some on-site programs there. Um, uh, we have some um, educational and financial planning programs done quarterly through a partner, um, Elder Life um, Financial actually is a, 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 a company that we partner with that offers those services to anybody or any prospect that's working with us, but more importantly to our existing residents to be able to stay longer. So most have some type of a veteran eligibility or something. So we do try to educate the greater public. Um, I would love to be able to um, get the word out when we do have upcoming seminars and programs. Um, so if you have recommendations as to how I can do that, besides um, through the Council on Aging, I will welcome those. I appreciate that, thank you. Yes, thank you. No one else? <laughs> Come on, this is the, the easiest part of my day. <laughs> I, I actually I had a chance to uh, visit you at the ribbon cutting and, and so forth. The design on the uh, memory care unit is incredible. When that's open to, for tours, I would love to come uh, and check it out. So. Yes, we're yeah. hoping to have some um, full-scale renderings um, done over the next couple months, and we're going to start ramping up to do maybe some hard hat tours as soon as we get a little bit further um, into our um, construction and completion. Um, I actually, uh, Tiffany, and I, Tiffany and I walked um, the frame in today and it's amazing to see um, the progress from week to week um, and even the apartments, the, the renovated apartments, as you know, that campus has been around for over 20 years. So the building really, um, it's like anything else, we all need a facelift every so often. <laughs> so it's nice that this, uh, that LCB is investing as much as they are into it um, and um, you know it, it's really going to be wonderful when it's done and I, I think it's great you know we don't we don't have anything else like it in Norton and um, you know some of the closest options to us in neighboring towns um, are beyond the the demographic and economics of some of the seniors so we're happy we can we can you know service everyone well, thank you for what you do yes thank you thank you right. appreciate can't wait to visit you Sometime, as the honorary yeah. mayor, not.
Come see me. Everybody stops and I have a lot of walk-ins. <laughs> yeah? We get a lot of calls and you know we're not the type of place that's just going to say no we can't help you. So I stay very educated on um, partnerships with Brister Elder Services and um, all of the available options for seniors. So I always give someone a next step and a resource. So even if you're looking for some additional information, we may be able to provide that to you as well. That's, that's excellent. And uh, in a few years, our Council on Aging will be uh, a bit closer yeah. to you than they are now. So that's a great opportunity I to know, see what else I we know, can that's do. Wonderful. It's certainly needed. So um, great group. We, uh, we had wonderful attendance yesterday, and they were very enjoyable. And I love it because there's no filter. They'll tell you the good and the bad, <laughs> so, which is always nice. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much thank for, you for, uh, for your time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Yes, thank Thanks you. for coming. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think next up, we have a visit from our uh, friend John Carroll. Uh, discussion and or vote to grant an extension to the mitigation agreement with Carroll Advertising. Uh, Mr. Carroll, are you still on? I, I see a text message from that is computer jammed up and I'm on phone muted. Oh, it's, uh, I'm assuming he is the one that I was muted earlier, so I'll see if I can uh, ask you to unmute, sir. All right. Well, Mike, do you want to speak to this while uh, sure. Mr. Carroll tries to uh, unmute? So previously, um, the board granted Mr. Carroll an extension. Um, he's looking at uh, a second location for another digital sign um, on 495. And uh, the board did give him an extension previously. And he had said to me that he lead, needs a little more time and uh, for the second sign. And he was looking to um, have an extension from the board pre again. Has there been any follow? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Mike, has there been any follow from? Have there been any complaints or issues with the existing sign? I know it dims after a certain hour, and uh, but in, it really doesn't shine on too many people's houses. Has I haven't, it been? Had, I haven't had one one complaint. Okay. Yeah. And the new location is proposed along that strip, right? Right, heading towards 495. I mean, heading towards the off ramp off of 495. Okay. And do we see that being a little more challenging, or being because it is closer to res more residential? Do you no, see that really? Just the opposite. It's heading more towards the industrial. Area. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. I know what you mean. So it's yeah, heading more heading, towards Bay Street. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, I see in the note that I had. Uh, Previously suggested a longer you extension did. than uh, <laughs> I just know to make sure that goes in two minutes, Jack. <laughs> foresight genius <laughs> there, Jack. Um, so uh, does anyone have any issue with uh, giving them an extension? Are we doing another six months? Or I would say okay. uh, and, and I would say uh, on like we had three meetings with MassDOT this week. Nobody is in office yeah. it's all virtual yeah. Yeah. and with us doing this extension doesn't interfere with the planning board right or anything like that or no. it starts with us to give them approval to move forward right right it Thank still you. has to go to them okay perfect right uh, so chair would entertain a motion to um, provide uh, an additional six-month extension to Carol advertising so moved second uh, Renee? Yes. Meg? Yes. Christine? Yes. Michael? Aye. I am a yes as well. All right. Uh, well, Mr. Carroll, sorry for your computer and phone issues, uh, but you're all set. Uh, Springtown Cleanup Day, which we talked about a bit in the announcements. Uh, anything else we want to? Has it been set? The date been set? I think that was. Oh, that's different. That was the reservoir cleanup. This is yes. Springtown. Yeah. This is Spring so, um, oh, I know uh, Christine yes. had brought this up. Um, so we haven't done it uh, since years. that dreadful uh, March mm. <laughs> uh, when COVID first came about. Um, we do it in the spring, and what we usually do is coordinate with Wheaton 
and uh, it's a uh, community project for them also and um, we usually start the day over at Wheaton College and they have coffee and donuts for the volunteers and Keith Silver and Joanne from the highway department uh, work closely with them in coordinating things and myself and any members of the board that want to uh, help out in the coordination and also so a lot of the boy scouts girl scouts residents volunteer we do it in early spring before anything starts growing so you can see uh, the trash and the mosquitoes and everything on out yet and um, a lot of so we'll have a lot of volunteers show up but also people will come in and say look me I'm gonna do my neighborhood with my kids and they'll pick up bags at the highway department the night before and they'll do their neighborhood leave the bags there and the highway department comes around and picks them up so it's a good way to have some community involvement and get uh, some cleanup done yeah I, I was excited Christine thanks for bringing it up because I had sp spoken to Keith about getting this back getting this going and he I know he was very excited about it too so I think this is great um, is it too early to I mean do you need to get with Keith to set a date or do you want to throw a proposed date out there or, or so or so forth um, I would talk to Keith and let Keith uh, figure out you know what will work into the schedule with the highway guys and uh, with Wheaton also because we want to work in between their spring break and so no, hey, Mike, if, if we can post to him um, Saturday, April twenty third, which is uh, coincides with Earth Day, I think that's how we've been doing the last couple ones to see if it would meet all those uh, parameters. Uh, okay. And I know, like St. Mary's has for their confirmation, there's the two cohorts. They have ten hours a year each kid of community service. <laughs> Um, that could fulfill five hours or yeah. so. Um, same with the high schools, they're back to having their community service requirements, so we get the word out. Mike, has, has there been any thoughts on trying to get sponsors for this? I know uh, Mansfield is a very successful one um, as well. Has there been any? I'm not sure what the funding mechanisms here and or if it's just man hours, labor, that kind of thing. Um, really, uh, there is, it's just, the bags um, and uh, yellow teachers guys picking up the stuff uh, that people put when the bags that people leave on the side of the road for us I mean so yeah. it's not that much um, if there was uh, any volunteer or anyone that was willing to donate you know it would be good for fluorescent t-shirts or something like that yeah. you know, um, Mr. Chair would be all right if I talk to Keith and try to bring this back from the next meeting? Can I, would anyone uh, be object to that or? I know Christine brought it up, so oh, perhaps sorry. the two of you guys could work together yeah. on that. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Um, so I'm not sure how the more recent ones have gone or if this has been done in the past. Um, I just remember where, I still have my Keith Norton beautiful shirt that I proudly <laughs> wear every so often. It's very bright and fluorescent. Um, well, A, can we get shirts back? I know that's a lot to do, um, but work on getting that. I know, you know, donations from local businesses, um, you know, they can have their names on their shirts and whatever, however we do that. And then the second thing, because I know if we, I'm not sure how it's been done more recently, but making sure that all like areas are addressed, not just like the popular areas, um, like the Common or Wheaton, make sure like the, the back roads, you know, people's communities. So I don't know if there's a way to do like some sort of, I know it might be a little, you know, too much coordination for, for this sort of event, um, but doing like some sort of sign up, like a Google Doc or something and just have like different neighborhoods set up or even just streets and then people can sign up and then that's how you get a t-shirt, that's how you get to come to Wheaton and enjoy the, the donuts and coffee and stuff. Um, I'm not sure if that's a way to coordinate that too, if that's, you know, something that we could try to do, just to make sure that all areas of the town are addressed. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, they did that uh, last time, Christine, they had like a list of streets and then if, if you didn't have a preference, they would assign you something. But okay. I think, Mike, didn't we, didn't we have a, a small committee put together for this? We did, yep. We had uh, myself, Keith, Joanne, members of the Board of Selectmen, and, uh, 
Wheaton College was on it. I'm trying to think of the title of there. The woman that runs that, that program. I'm trying to think of what the title of her, what, um, her title was, but I can't. Yeah. Christine, just everything you're saying, it's, it's um, great ideas and a lot of work. It's, I think it, it's worth getting that, getting a committee back yeah. together for it. Agreed. Definitely. And spring will come up fast on us. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so Mike, if there's any way that we could get, like, um, if you gather all the people, maybe just send out, like, an email to yep. everybody, um, all the board members, and then whoever has previously worked on it, and that way we can get the ball rolling on it. Excellent. Well, thanks, Christine, for bringing this up. It's, um, it's a good time. I was amazed um, how many bags of dog poop there are. <laughs> oh! when people go through the trouble to pick it up and put it into a bag but then throw the bag itself into the woods it's just a level of rationale that I don't I don't follow uh, all right on that note uh, completely unrelated fall town meeting uh, so I think we have the article list hey, Mike what is what's the timeline on this particular one for us to remove articles? Um, town meeting is October 25th, so um, it's 14 days before that. October 11th? Yeah. No, 14th, yeah, 11th. I'm only asking because it's, it's already 10 after 9 and we still have executive sessions. Is it something we can move oh, to next you, week? Yeah, you have plenty of time. Okay. All right. So we will table this one. Great call. Yes, I like that. <laughs> I got your back, buddy. <laughs> Okie dokie. And mine. So would that also apply to the next one or should we... I, if I recall correctly, something like this is just a procedural item right. that allows the... If, if I could on this one... Um, on A, if you could do that. Okay. Um, B, I'm not sure. I think B might just be a placeholder for now. I got to review again with Paul. Um, no one has come forward really, you know, to look to develop that property and want it rezoned yet. Okay. Um, so, but A, um, if you could refer that to the planning board. Um, this is Leonard Street, and due to the widening of Leonard Street. Um, Condine, as part of the process, had to use their land, which became part of Leonard Street. So they the, it would be accepting the land donation and the layout of uh, uh, Leonard Street. And so Planning Board will have to review the plan and a, um, vote a recommendation to come back to you to accept Leonard Street. Okay. So this is just formally asking the planning board to look at something and then they'll come back and ask us Correct. to. Okay. Uh, so chair would entertain a motion to refer the zoning article for the acceptance of altered layout of Leonard Street and, and authorization of our parcels for to the planning board for non-binding recommendation. So moved. Second. Right. Uh, Renee. Yes. Yeah. Meg? Yes. Christine? Yes. Michael? Aye. I am yes as well. Do we want to do the other one? If it's just... Um, Might as well. Uh, you're here next week, so I'll talk to Paul, and then uh, okay. if we need to, we'll do it next week. All righty. Uh, which brings us to our last item under new business, uh, discussion on Xfinity Center issues. Uh, and Christina, this one was one you had asked to put on, so yeah, um, we can discuss it. <laughs> can we move Sorry, it to an earlier our, um, item? Well, then it would technically be, technically be old business. Well, if we haven't talked about it, I would still say it's new. Yeah, can we put it as new business towards the beginning for next week? honestly, ne yeah, next week because it's really more just like concerts in general mm -hmm. and everything. So we could even do it to you know the three weeks. So I think the concerts are almost done. Okay. There might be, I think there's like one Chris Stapleton concert after that. There's 15. It was, is, the, it was is, the dead concert that put everyone over. Yeah, that was kind of, um, so like the background story, I worked 
Fenway Grateful Dead mm. many times, and it was not as bad as here. Mm. Oh, I couldn't but get But there's home. so I'm many different, so many different. I'm so yeah. Fenway's to different shopping, than here. and yeah. I couldn't get back to yeah. the crossing. It took me almost an hour and a half, and to go back roads, like I had to go, I had to figure out a back roads because Cobb Street was so backed up, I couldn't even get down my street. Yeah. So basically, did, did we the, want. I'm sorry, Kristen, did we want to just talk about for five minutes? Because I did see Chief Clark come on video, so I think he's been waiting. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Quick. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think just, that was the with the worst. I actually called. Yeah. I actually, I actually called the Norton police, and I just said, I get it. I know you guys are trying, and it's Mansfield too, and all that. It was just, it took me by surprise because after I think it was two years ago when we had that really big debacle, and I had people peeing on my front yard and people throwing <laughs> trash, and it was insanity. Yeah. Then it seemed like it got corrected. Then COVID mm -hmm. hits. So there's no concert, and then that dead concert threw me for a loop because. Yeah. Like I said, I couldn't even get down my street. Yeah, and that hit the, um, so I'm over on the west side of town, yeah. and that was the worst I'd ever seen it. Traffic yeah. was backed up from Freeman uh, all the way past the middle school and well past Oak Street. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't even see the end of the cars, and I've so, never seen that happen. I, and I don't know, someone had said that they were doing COVID testing, and that was, but then I heard later it was in the, I don't yeah. know, so who knows, Chief but Clark. clearly yep. it was an issue. Uh, Chief, I, I see you're on. Uh, yeah, so I mean, you know, every once, at least once a year, we ha we have this discussion about Xfinity. Um, I did invite Jason Sandoval, who is the general manager. I don't see him on. Um, you know, we are we are truly held hostage by the lot openings at Xfinity Center, which we have zero control over. Ways itself is just devastating. We have three offices who are. Uh, at pinch points in town so that people don't go into the side roads like Reservoir Street or Cobb Street. Um, but what we saw at this concert was we saw Labor Day weekend on a Friday afternoon with a sold out show with a late, later block opening. And we saw a lot of vehicles coming from Mansfield, like coming off of the highway, north, coming from the north, going through Norton um, the back roads on the North Washington Street sent there by ways. Um, you know, the we got a, we we got about probably 20 complaints. Most of the complaints were, you know, what what's all the traffic in town about? Um, we got one for a tour bus that was turning around. Um, you know, the officers did their, the best they could yeah. to stop the vehicles from coming in Reservoir Street area. I think that worked out pretty well. But you know, it's the backups are just incredible. Um, when people come late to the concert, like happened, it's, happened it, it's, it's like a funnel, right? But you have a, a big funnel with a little spout at the end, and there's all these cars trying to shoot into this area. It's, it's just very, very difficult. Um, it's really, you know, kind of out of our control, to be quite honest with you. Um, you know, Smith Street was a, was a concern because Smith Street ways is putting people down Smith Street when they're coming, when they're going north on Mansfield Ave and it's not getting them anywhere. Um, we did talk to Xfinity at the beginning of the season. We told them our concerns. They've been pretty good with, with details and, and such. Um, I, for the Chris Stapleton concert, we are going to add a detail officer for Smith Street. Um, there's really only one, two, three, four, five, seven goes left and uh, Chris Stapleton to figure out a couple seconds. So. All right. That's why, that's why. And the questions. On August 28th, I was stuck in that traffic for the Pitbull concert end. September 3rd, this is the photo of the... Um, thanks, Peter. <laughs> yeah. There we go, buddy. Uh, and also, no, we, we get it. I think it's just, again, it was it was sort of like out of the blue, it felt like. And I, that's probably because we didn't have concerts last year, so it is what it is. But um, we appreciate, you know, I see, I see all the signs. I see all the detail. I know you guys are trying. I'm not sure what else to do about it. So like the one thing that I, I don't know what's possible or what's not possible um, is the more my concern is like the side streets like are, for lack of a better term, our streets, like residence streets. Like you're not going down Cobb Street to go any, you shouldn't be going down Cobb Street anywhere besides you're living in that area or you're trying to get to the highway. That's usually what I use that street for. So like it's more residence, it's, it's I, I don't know how to word it. Is there a way to do like 
a safety patrol. So I know you guys don't have, you know, all the officers handy available, but is there any way where those signs are that say no concert traffic to have like volunteers in bright, you know, safety vests just when a car turns down the street, stop them, mm -hmm. check their ID and say, do you live in Norton? If you live in Norton, cool, you can pass. If not, please turn around and go back to 123. Well, we do. We have for these concerts, including the Big Dead show, we had an officer at North Washington at Cobb. We had one at um, Elm and Reservoir. We had one at Reservoir and 140. So they're not necessarily getting into those side streets. Um, the officers are stopping cars um, the best they can, right? I mean, you know, usually you know who's going to a concert and who's not, who lives in that area. Um, they turned around, you know, numerous cars. Um, it, it's just. I don't know how to get around waves. If you if you go on waves for a concert during a concert, it tells you to expect Xfinity to play. But waves is so convoluted. I went to Yarmouth yesterday, and it, it I put waves on just to see what the traffic was, like, and it was going to send me down the Cranberry Highway rather than send me to the Bourne Bridge when there was absolutely no traffic. So I mean, you know, how do you how do you get around that? Yeah. All right. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, old business. Update on Plain Street Solar. Yeah, I don't know. I know Daniel Sherba could be on, but he said someone from the company may be on. He was traveling, so I don't know. If, I don't see anyone on I, my yeah, screen. Yeah, I don't see. Maybe this is something we can put back on for next week. Yeah. All right. Uh... Uh, we have uh, town manager's disclo disclosure of appearance of conflict of interest form. Yep. This is um, a form that I would file annually. Um, I just wanted to uh, bring it to the attention of the board. I'm trying to get to that in my packet. <laughs> so, um, it's a form that I'm filing because uh, my son is an employee of the Norton Public Library and uh, on advice of counsel they suggest every year that I file a disclosure report just uh, stating that and remind the board that I have no authority as to hiring or setting of salary in the public library and uh, just that as town manager I will be advising the finance committee on budget issues so I'm disclosing that I can and will be fair and objective when performing my duty as town manager. And as a non-elected public employee, I'm responsible to file this disclosure with the uh, pointing authority, which is the board. Right. So, do we need to vote to accept or just, um, you just file it? Just file it. Okay. Any questions for Mike on this? Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, update on OPM recommendations. So we had three. Uh, the building committee has uh, recommended three companies um, to me to uh, be interviewed for one as project managers on the job for the town hall and uh, the senior community center, Vertex Company, Answer Advisory, and STV. And so uh, I know two of them are scheduled for next week, and we're, we're waiting to hear from one more of the companies. What was the uh, second name? Um, answer, answer. A N S E R. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. If Mike, I'm sorry, which uh, schedule next week they're coming in front of us or they're doing a presentation in front of the PVC or somebody else? No, they're coming to meet with me okay. and the chair of the uh, pub the permanent building committee. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. Excellent. And uh, I think we got 13 responses to the R. 13, yeah. yeah. Which was so good. good response. Uh, all right. Any other, anything else in your world? Uh, just, uh, I understand that the county did vote finally, uh, the co Bristol County com uh, Commissioners uh, to allot the money that they received proportionally. So for us, that could be another $3 million in American recovery 
oh, wow. uh, money, so um, that is good to hear. And I just wanted to, I don't know if I brought this up at the last meeting, I think this might have been after uh, your last meeting, but there were some concerns ra raised about um, power outages um, over in the Newcomb Street area and uh, the K Street neighborhoods about the number of outages. And so I did hear back from National Grid and uh, they do. They are going to do some work out there, uh, install on a splice box, change out some fuses and insulators in that area um, that will hopefully minimize some of the outages that they've been having out there. Excellent. Mike, has there ever been any discussion about trying to raise the union, the union loop to put them on high poles instead of telephone poles? I mean, it really is the... Achilles of the town for power. We have one source coming in, going into very few substations on on telephone poles instead of real high wires. Has there ever been a discussion from the state to the national grid or anyone? I know we've mentioned that to them before, and it's something that we should talk to them about again and get an explanation from them on why they don't do that there. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, select board report and mail. So we do have a, uh, a letter of commendation that came uh, from the Southeastern Massachusetts Regional 9-11 District to uh, Emily Archer, uh, communications officer, um, for a call that she dealt with on August 7th. Uh, I'd just like to, to read that in. Uh, this is from uh, Robert Verdone. Uh, Executive Director, uh, Southeastern Massachusetts Regional 911 District. Uh, letter of commendation. I note with pride and I'm pleased to commend you for your performance of duty while assigned as a call taker August 7th, 2021. At 8.57, the Southeastern Massachusetts Regional Emergency Communications Center received the call for a five-year-old female not breathing. Quickly gathering the address and using the Echo Fast Track and Proqua EMD, you ensured a rapid sequence call to dispatch. From the time of call to the dispatch point was 22 seconds. Although presented with an anxious caller, you may remained on track with questioning to assist the caller with medical help before responders arrival. Utilizing your training and certification, you began the life-saving pre-arrival instructions for a cardiac arrest on a child patient. You instructed the caller to assess breathing, give breaths, and then compressions. You did all this in a calm, clear tone, reassuring the caller when needed and remaining on track with instructions, all while showing concern for the caller's health, asking if there was someone with him to take over CPR if he got tired. You compassionately reassured the caller several times that help was on the way and also reassured him that he was doing a great job. Although the outcome was far from what we would hope for, just know that the way you conducted yourself during this call made a difference. You are commended for your outstanding performance of duty. By your commendable service, you have upheld the highest expectations and traditions of a public safety professional. Uh, that is quite a powerful note. Um, so, uh, I don't know what to say after that other than uh, thank Emily for her service. Um, that's, that's really powerful. Um, Hate to ask, but for anyone to follow that, but does anyone else have any? No? Okay. Uh, Jack, I do have one thing per, on a personal note, and like I said, I hate to follow that because it's not even close. I am on the uh, evening of August 29th, I was in a personal car accident, and I just wanted to thank uh, the Norton Police Department and the Norton Fire Department for uh, coming to, to my aid. Um, they really, I think they, you know, I was, wasn't aware of what was going on when it happened, but I wanted to thank them personally. Um, I think they they uh, they stepped up from what I've understood and made the difference in me getting better, and, and I'm on the mend now. So, but I just wanted to personally thank them for that. Excellent. I'm glad you're doing well and still with us. Yes. Um, all right. Uh, warrants and minutes. Uh, 
So I've approved payroll warrant PR 22-05 for the week ended August 21, 2021. Warrant dated August 26, 2021 in the amount of $622,675.91. Invoice warrant AP 22-09, dated August 26, 2021, in the amount of $1,801,917.17. Invoice warrant AP 22-10, uh, dated September 2, 2021, in the amount of $440,174.67. Payroll warrant PR 22-06, for the week ended September 4, 2021. Warrant dated September 9th, 2021, in the amount of $1,558,492.00. And lastly, invoice warrant AP 22-11, dated September 9th, 2021, in the amount of $285,231.72. Was August 26th and August, uh, I'm sorry, September 4th, were those health care and Benefit payments uh, yes. the ledger. Uh, I believe that is the case. Yep. Uh, we have three minutes uh, outstanding. Uh, I personally have not reviewed them. I don't know if anyone else has had an opportunity. Not. I have not. All right. So why don't we kick those? Uh, our next meeting is set for next Thursday, September sixteenth, seven p.m. Uh, yes. I'm assuming everyone is still comfortable with hybrid in this format. Yep. Okay. Uh, is there any other business to come before the open session of the board? Back Nick Bean in the library, right? Yep, we'll be back here, Peter. Thank you. You got it. Uh, all right. Um, seeing no other business for this session, uh, we do have an executive session scheduled for this evening. Uh, so uh, I declare under general laws, chapter 30A, section 21 little a3 that the purpose of the executive session will be to discuss strategy with respect to litigation i.e bella music because the discussion of the strategy in open session could compromise the purpose of the executive session and with the board to not return to open session at the conclusion of the executive session i move that the board go into executive session under general law uh, chapter 30a subsection 21a3 for the purposes and reasons declared by the chair with the with the board to not return to open se open session thereafter I just need a second second all right we have a motion and a second it's a roll call vote uh renee yes meg yes christine yes michael aye I too am yes. So this uh, ends our open session for anyone still on Zoom. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good night and we'll see you next week. Hmm.